Hey everyone, Mario again coming at you another review. Today I'm continuing Monster Fest, and today's a film like a couple of the other ones that I've been meaning to see for several years. But this one especially, considering that I've seen other films in this series, I mean, the two predecessors to this film, a remake of the two predecessors. So I was like, why haven't I watched this one? Partially because before now I hadn't been unable to find a copy of it to watch, and it hadn't been on Netflix, but it's been on Netflix for a while, and I was like, you know what, I'll give it a watch, you know, perfect thing. And I have to say, after watching it, of the original three films, between this and the predecessor, but I think I might like this one a little bit more. I'll probably have to watch them back to back. They both have some of the humor, but this one just seems a tad bit more serious. Maybe that's just me looking at it. And it also has the advantage of having a higher budget than its predecessor, so maybe it also looks a little bit more polished. Even though, from what I understand, its budget got cut in half. The film, of course, I'm talking about is George A. Romero's 1985 film, Day of the Dead. And before he made Land of the Dead, this was the third and final entry in his trilogy, which is now... I don't know what phrase you would use now for it, because how many films are in this dead series now? Let's see, there's Night, Dawn, Day, Land, Diaries, and Survival, so... Lucky has two trilogies. And then, of course, there's the remake series. And then the Return of the Living Dead series and all the unofficial stuff. But anyway, the film has a 7.2 on IMDb, which is a very great score, but though I think that's a little lower than Dawn, or maybe a little higher. I'm not going to check. As a 75 with the audience on Rotten Tomatoes and an 82 with the critics. No consensus though. So it's one of those films that, that see most people seem to enjoy and I would agree with that because it is an enjoyable film. Now, unlike most sequels, it does not fall into the category of the dreaded third film curse because it just seems that most film series seem to suffer from that. I mean, the only other one that doesn't come to mind that suffers from that, that would suffer from that is uh, Star, Star Wars. I mean, in both trilogies, because if you look at it with Star Wars, and even though, personally, I think Empire is better than Jedi, and I think Jedi is still better than the first film, then, of course, with the prequel trilogy, most people who actually, most people will say that of the prequel trilogy, the third film is the best one, so in that one, it kind of is the reverse. <laughs> but most of the film series I can think of, the third one always gets the shaft. I mean, Alien 3, uh... Technically speaking, pre yeah, Predators, depending on who you ask. Is that the third film in the individual series? Godfather 3, even though I haven't seen it, or its predecessor. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of them on top of my, top of my head. Halloween 3, but that one was unfairly done. I wouldn't say that one. I'd say that one doesn't fall into the curse film-wise, more how it was, you know, taken by the audience in the time it was released. Um... Oh, I can think of off the top of my head. Probably the 13th 3 doesn't really fall into it, but I'd say I don't really enjoy it as much as the two predecessors as a whole. I think it's more big series that usually fall into it. The little, the smaller ones don't seem to fall into it that much. Anyway, I, I think I made my point pretty clear. It doesn't fall into that. Anyway, uh, this is something Romero apparently described it. He described it as a tragedy about how a lack of human communication causes chaos and collapse, even in this small little pie slice of society. Makes sense. You see that in the final film. Now, the film uh, features Sherman Howard in an early appearance as Bub, and Gregory Nicotero plays the character, and he assists Tom Savini with the makeup effects. That's right, Tom Savini returned to do the makeup effects. And with the higher budget, they are fantastic. I know he's not really a fan of how he did his makeup effects in the previous film, which, you know, you know you're always going to be your own worst critic when it comes to your own work. Personally, I like them there, even though they do kind of have that little bit of a comic book feel, but from what I understand, that's what they were going with with the film. In this one, you can see that Savini took advantage of the higher budget, and they come off as looking a little bit better. I mean, the ones that the zombies that come inside at the end, you can tell the at they have that dark, like almost a purple gray tone to the skin, which I guess is supposed to show they're decaying, but they're not at the point of you know stuff falling out, or at least all of them. 
so it looks it looks like decaying flesh, but not to the point where like things are gonna fall off, like their jaws gonna fall off, like the first zombie we see in the film. But it works. Now, the thing about this is that apparently Romero originally intended the film to be the Gone with the Wind of zombie films. But of course he couldn't realize that because of budget disputes and the artistic need to release the film unrated. The film of the, the film budget was ultimately cut in half from 7 million to 3.5 and it doesn't really hurt the film that much. It makes you wonder what the film was going to originally be, but it might have been where it might have been a little bit too pretentious or might have just been a little bit too overblown, or maybe it might have ended up being actually better than the final film. That's one of those what-ifs. But right away, you can tell that this film has a higher budget than the, pre the two previous films, because remember right now, The Living Dead had basically a, li a very, very limited budget, and while higher, Dawn of the Dead was still also limited. I know officially they said it was like, I think, one to two million, but I've heard from people like on Tom Savini when he was on Chris Jericho's podcast, he's said that it wasn't it wasn't even a million. Granted, he might have not, not known, but I'm guessing it was probably at least less than a million, but even still, that film looks great. And this is a 3.5. You can see the increase in the budget, but it's mostly in some of the props and in the makeup effects. That's where you really see the added money. And also with some of the sets, especially the underground set. And apparently, to get the story that the film has, Romero... Uh, had to write a total of five different drafts of the script, so I'm guessing. Initial draft, that was gone with the wind, and then rewriting to cut back and make this make the story a little bit more streamlined. And then succeeded. It was filmed in Pennsylvania and in Florida, which you can really tell that because the opening scene takes place in Fort Myers. Big giveaway is the fact that one of the bodies is crawling with land crabs and there's also an alligator. <laughs> I did think adds a little bit I think that kind of fits the opening, especially when the zombie walks out behind and the gator's like moves. Makes me wonder why them why they don't attack the gator for food. I don't know. Maybe it's like the remake of Dawn of the Dead. They only attack humans and just leave the dog alone. It's like, hey Bob, 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 a dog, leave the dog alone. The human meat. Something weird like that. Uh, apparently, the film was given a very limited release, which is sad. And I'm guessing that might be. Because of the fact it was unrated, which that's kind of the balance. Or get a very wide release. I'd probably would have done the same thing Romero did, and you know, not compromise my artistic vision. But that's just me. And of course, it got a very great reception. And of course, it's homaged a lot, and everyone knows a lot of the stuff, especially the famous line that Colonel, no, it's not Colonel, it's Captain Rhodes, says in his come up and scene. Ciao, come on. But from what I heard, that was ad lib, and that's a very good ad lib. And of course, there's other great lines like, "I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein." I'm gonna sh and basically, Rhodes threatening to shoot a woman if she doesn't sit down. I told you he was gonna shoot you if you didn't sit down. You didn't sit down. And that's just some of it and the other stuff. I'm not gonna salute that thing. I know I'm probably messing some of them up, but a lot of memorable dialogue. A lot of these films always seem to have memorable dialogue, like the previous film had. We got this, man. We got this by the ass. <laughs> That's the thing about Romero. He always seems to come up with fun dialogue like that. Anyway, the film takes place a set of, how much? A, set, a little bit after Dawn of the Dead. Never states how long. I'm guessing probably at least a year. Zombies have overridden the entire world, so we've gone from the plague starting in Night of the Living Dead to it being like a minor thing that they might be able to round up to the zombies beginning to overwhelm them in Dawn of the Dead to where basically humans are in small bands and now they've basically overrun the world and there's only isolated settlements. The only one we see of course is the remaining fragments of the US government and military hiding out in military bases, specifically this one military base that's somewhere either in Florida or Pennsylvania. It's never given an exact location, we just know that they went into Florida at the beginning. Anyway, we see the opening scene where they're looking to find people. They don't find anyone. They just find a bunch of zombies. So they return to the army base where we find that at least at this base, all that's left is a small group of scientists supported by a skeleton crew of soldiers. And they're trying to figure out a way to reverse the reanimation process. Uh, our lead scientist is Dr. Logan, called, I'm guessing, a little bit sarcastically, 
maybe also was a term of endearment, Frankenstein. Also, you do how he dissects zombies. He believes zombies can be trained to be docile, which kind of makes sense, because even if they are reanimated dead corpses, they are still human corpses. They still have the same brains and all that, even if not all of it is reanimated. So, it makes a little bit of sense, even if it's going to take him a long time to do it. Which, kind of, his work and what he wants to do is at odds with the new base commander, Captain Rhodes. He becomes the commander by default when the next higher, with the next higher ranking officer above him, a major, dies off screen. So by default he's the highest ranking person and probably the, for most things the only officer left. So by default he's the base commander. And just from the first scene we see him, he's probably not a guy you would want in charge of anything. You wouldn't want him to go find lost kids, let alone be in charge of a base at the end of the world. And the moment you see him, you just want to smack him, and you know he's going to get a comeuppance in the end, because that seems to be that seems to be what happens in films like this. And we're not disappointed. That's all I'm going to say about it. Anyway, the whole the tension in the film is mostly between the scientists, or at least two of them. One of them being a female, the only female on the base. What's her character's name is um, Sarah. Anyway, it's the scientists and the soldiers. Mostly, the soldier one seems to come mostly from Captain Rhodes being impatient. Part of the reason why I say you don't want him in charge of anything like this. And, of course, his lower-ranking enlisted people going along with him. They're basically paid characters. That's basically what their entire thing is. They're kind of jerks. And, of course, uh, Frankenstein's uh, experiments obviously are going to take too long. And he seems to be the main one in the science group interested in trying to figure stuff out. I mean, uh, anyway, Sarah wants to figure stuff out because obviously she's a doctor. But it seems to be in a diff different than what Frankenstein wants. And he, she also is in with two of the other characters, uh, John and McDermott. And, of course, they have formed their own little clique at one point. So at one point near the end of the film, it's basically the soldiers in one area are hurt, both three in the bottom, and then of course the side of the doctor over by himself, along with his uh, pet experiment, Bub the Zombie, which is basically his attempt to uh, try to tame zombies, and it does work to an extent. It's kind of cool to see. I mean, the whole thing where he sees Rhodes, you know, he sees an and he like does a little, little weird salute thing, <laughs> has to a little bit of humor here and there. Look at a salute that thing, <laughs> you know, like that, and then looking at the gun, which at which, of course, adds a little humor later on when uh, Rhodes gets his comeuppance. I'm not going to spoil it, but those of you who see the film know what I'm talking about. And the tension that carries throughout the whole film, you're going to tell it's going to explode in the end, and that's what leads to the whole thing in the end. Which, of course, leads, like most of the other films like this, to the zombies finally getting in. That seems to be the thing with all these films. Somehow the zombies get in in the third act. It only seems to be because of the tension between the characters. Which I guess this is why these films are character studies in human nature. I mean, the first film you had it, the second film you had it, the third film you had it. From what I understand, Land has it. I don't know about the other two because I haven't seen them. But that's the thing is, it's always human nature. It just shows that humans will self-destruct like that. And kind of sad, it is true though. But of course, we see that we can rebuild and we can cooperate. I mean, John, Sarah, and McDermott—they all cooperate in the end, and that's why they basically get the happy ending of the film. And most of these films don't really have happy ending. I mean, Night of the Living Dead looks like it's going to have a happy ending, and then our, main, our lead gets shot. Of course, you can debate whether or not they thought he was a zombie or whether or not, you know, since they're good old balls, they're going to take the moment to be racist and go, ah, oh, what? It's a Negro! <laughs> that old thing. Of course, Dawn, Dawn of the Dead, you know, kind of it's been a while since I've seen the ending, if I remember right, it's downbeat, yet also this one, upbeat. This one, at least for those three characters, it's definitely upbeat, even though we don't know how long they're going to be able to stay like that. And of course, the remakes. The remake of Night has this upbeat ending, at least for the female character. Of course, Dawn of the Dead, that's debatable whether you think they survived or not, but, you know, that's a debatable thing, like the ending of Halloween 3. Well, I think you turned it off, so you're an optimist then. <laughs> At all that. Me, I think this probably would have good, been a good way to end the series, but then, of course, we go into Land of the Dead, which you'll probably review one day down the road. 
But of the original three films, this is probably my favorite. But like I said, I'd probably have to watch Dawn and uh, Day back to back. I mean, maybe one of these days I'll watch all three of them back to back. Do like a dead marathon. Probably not re review them, but you know, just watch them back to back. And then, you know, maybe do a top ten of my favorite moments from the first three films. Who knows? Anyway, the acting in this film, top notch. I mean, uh, the characters, some of them don't have a lot of depth to them, mostly because they're mostly figure focusing on the here and then, here and now of the film. You know, you see a little bit of insight into who they were before the apocalypse, but it's not like it's going to go in-depth, in-depth into it, but it's not really required. It's more about how they react to the apocalypse. That's the thing about this. I mean, if this was an ongoing series, like let's say how they do it in... Uh, the Walking Dead, then you would expect to see a little bit more insight in them, but that's, that's a different medium. This is a more straight one, whereas Walking Dead is an episodic, both in its TV format and, of course, in its source material format. And by the way, I'd like to apologize if the uh, video in this video quality seems down in this. I'm recording this with the software on my uh, laptop because I'm downloading something on my desktop, even though I have a program with the camera plugged in, it's doing something weird. Maybe it's because of the light. Let's see if that changes. Is that changing anything? No, I might have to change something. I think I have to change the quality thing on this. Maybe that's probably what it is. So sorry about if the quality for this one is poor. It'll probably it'll definitely be fixed by the next one. Anyway, it's that time. Time for the trivia. Most of the zombie extras in this film were Pittsburgh residents who volunteered to help in the film. And all the extras who portrayed zombies received this for their services. A cap that said, I played a zombie in Day of the Dead. A copy of the newspaper from the beginning of the film, the one that says the dead walk. And one dollar. I got you a dollar. Oh, you gotta be quicker than that. The lowest grossing film in the Dead trilogy, nevertheless, it's gained a cult following over the last two. And on the special edition DVD, George Romero claims this is his favorite film out of the original Dead trilogy. Okay, I already mentioned that. But the original uh, script involved a scientist living above ground in a fortress protected by electrified fences and the military living safely underground. It also involved a small army of trained zombies and the conclusion to the trilogy was more brutal than the release version and this later became the basis for Land of the Dead. During a holiday break in filming, makeup artist Greg Nicotero used a realistic and gruesome model of his own head that we've seen in one of the laboratory scenes, to play a practical joke on his mother. I wish that was videotaped, because that sounds like something to be very funny to show. How the... Greg! Watch your head in the refrigerator! Watch your head in the turkey's ass! This is a nice little thing I noticed, because I'd already read through the trivia when I watched the film. The book Dr. Logan gives to Bub in one scene is Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Of course, Romero and King have been friends for many years, and of course... There was a little collaboration in the 80s, so it's a nice little touch to see. In the cafeteria scene, uh, William McDermott says that all the shopping malls are closed. This is obviously a reference to the previous film. I caught in the like, eh, that's kind of clever. Uh, first attempts to shoot the scene where Sarah performed surgery on Miguel's arm failed when it simply bounced off the rubber. So Savini remade it in wax, and it worked perfectly. According to Lori Cardilli, the first attempt to shoot the beginning dream scene when the zombie arms suddenly spring out of the wall and attack her resulted in the fake wall and many of the actors behind it toppling over on her. I can imagine that wall ended up needing to be completely rebuilt and this time it was more stable. Yeah, that one. Uh, Sarah, John McDermott, Miguel, Dr. Logan, Bub, and of course Captain Rhodes are the only characters from Romero's original script that made it to this final version. So I'm guessing all the other soldier characters were invented for it when he had to abridge his original idea. Uh, during Miguel's sedation, Lori told Anthony to actually slap her to make it look more authentic. I can go with that. I can buy that. The underground facility... I guess it makes this, makes the this scene look a little bit better, too. The underground facility was not on a soundstage. It was shot in the Wampum Mine, a former limestone mine near Pittsburgh, it was being used for an underground storage facility. But you can really tell that it was actually shot underground because just some of the little nuances, even though it's, you know, mostly in the dark, the little nuances of the walls and stuff, you're like, okay, they're in an actual cave. 
add to the overall feel of the film. Uh, right after Logan tells the zombie that it needs to sit in the dark and think about what it did and turns the light off, a little bit of the gonk music from Dawn of the Dead can be heard in the transition. Uh, okay, I already mentioned there. This is a little thing. That's a little interesting. Both actors who played Captain Rhodes in the two versions of Day of the Dead, this one and its remake, appeared in both versions of Dawn of the Dead as police officers. In the 78 version, Joseph Pilato played an officer at the police dock asking for cigarettes. And of course, Ving Rangs played a cop in the remake of Dawn of the Dead, and then he played Captain Rhodes in the remake of this film. One of the arms in the opening dream sequence was played by Laurie's husband. The first scene, The Abandoned City, was filmed in Fort Myers in Sanibel Island, Florida. Uh, Pat Logan, who played Uncle Reg in Night of the Living Dead, appears as a bald, mustachioed zombie shot by steel in the mines. Okay. Real and pig intestines were used in the gore scenes, and apparently for, the, for Rhodes' demise, the refrigerator housing them had been turned off, so they were rotting and they were bad. So you can just imagine how bad that scene must have been to film. Like that podcast I mentioned earlier with Derek Cohen to me, he actually mentioned that. That's how I learned about that. I'm like, ooh. But it looked, you know, in the end of the day, it looks, pays off the gore. Let's see. George Romero is a zombie pushing a cart in the foreground during the final zombie fest, seen from the waist down, identified by his trademark pale scarf. I guess that's his cameo. Uh, there some of the headlines from the newspapers say the dead walk. Uh, a vice president declares state of emergency. Whereabouts of president unknown. Food supply dwindles and man bites man. The first uh, film in the series to have a clown zombie <laughs> took them long enough. Uh, uh, I'm skipping through this is mostly music stuff. Uh, either just cameos. Okay, I mentioned that already. Okay, I mentioned that. Uh, Romero had originally planned for all the zombies to perish in a massive explosion when they stumbled across explosive chemicals in the laboratory. Meanwhile, one of the crew members who had died during the attack was to have stayed dead and not come back to li life as a zombie, thereby giving hope to the survivors. That would have been interesting, but I'm guessing that's in the original script, or he had to cut it because of the budget. The only movie in the Dead series where a zombie has a line of dialogue, which, of course, from what I've mentioned about Bob, you can probably see why. The zombies who attack Rhodes during his comeuppance are played by Hermie Grantai. Is that a, yeah, that's nice. David Garantai, Joey Garantai, and Rick Garantai of the Pittsburgh rock band the Garantai Brothers, otherwise known as G-Force. Paul Gen Gagne, I'm guessing. Robert Martin, Mark Steensland, and Donald Farmer appear as Rickle Zombie attackers in the mine. Interesting. That's basically all the trivia. And there's nothing really else much to say about the film. Romero does a good job of shooting the film. The special effects are excellent, especially the makeup and gore effects. The actors do a good job for their characters. Like I said, they're not written deeply, but it, they don't really need to for what the film is. Uh, probably the standout performance is probably Rhodes, and that's because of how insane the character is. Frankenstein would probably be number two, and then I'd pray probably from a writing standpoint, either Sarah or... John, I'm guessing it is. The, guy, the guys who play the all the rest of the soldiers, they they do their job well by coming off and taking kicks. Cinematography is good. I like the lighting in the cave sequences. The actors that played all the actors that played all the zombies really did get into character with it and played it well. And all this together is why I'd say this is most likely my favorite of the three original ones. And it's one you definitely should watch. I give it a four and a half out of five stars. And if you're a fan of zombie movies and you haven't seen this, or any of Romero's zombie films, I'd say at least give the first three a watch in the order they were made. 